Good morning. Welcome here. My name is Jeff, uh, one of the pastors here at Grace Evergreen, along with Sam Whitehawk. So glad that you joined us this morning. Glad to be here. Two weeks ago, we started a, a sermon series in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to continue that today. So uh, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to find your way there. Uh, we are in chapter one uh, of Luke. If you need to know where Luke is, you can use your table of contents in your Bible, or you can phone a friend, or you can pull the audience, or you can just find out where it is. Uh, if you have an app, it makes it really easy. But chapter one, uh, we're looking at verses 26 to 38, and we're going to read it in just a little bit. But uh, this morning, as we, as we look at this passage, we're going to be introduced to a character that you may have known. If you have grown up in the church, you may be familiar with, uh, maybe you've heard of. Uh, this is maybe especially at Christmas time, you think of this, of this story. And so what we're looking at now, I know we just came through Christmas, but we are going to be getting into uh, looking at the birth of Jesus in these next few weeks and be talking about that. I know it might seem odd, but this is, this is what we're doing is we're going through uh, this book. And uh, here at Grace, uh, we, we go through uh, these books of the Bible verse, verse by verse. And so we're not going to, we're not going to skip over the Christmas story because maybe you've heard it before, or we're not going to skip over it because it's not Christmas time. That's not really how we roll. So we're going to, we're going to keep going through this. But this morning, there's a character that we're going to, we're going to look at today. And it's her, uh, her name is Mary. And you may have heard of her, like I said, if you've grown up in the church, but maybe if you haven't, that's okay too. We're going to, we're going to learn more about her this morning. Mary, this is the, the mother of Jesus. And specifically, what we're going to look at this morning is we're going to see a, a visit that she gets from an angel, an angel named Gabriel, and tells her that she's going to have a baby, and this baby's name is going to be Jesus. And so that's kind of the, the story in the synopsis. Maybe I just gave everything away, and you feel like I can just go now, but no, there's, a, there's more we're going to look at. So I just wanted to give you the, kind of the overview of everything we're going to look at this morning. morning. So this is the story we're going to see, and, uh, but I think there's some new things in here that, that I found as, as you read it. And that's one of the things that I love about the Word of God. You know, we can, even a story that's familiar, that maybe you've read before, you, you've heard before, and you can read it again, and there's something new that, that jumps out. And I, and I love that that's what, that's what happens when we read God's Word, and that's what happened as I, as I was prepping for that. So we are going to do that this morning. Um, so, but before we listen to our passage, there's something that I want you to listen for as we go through our passage. And there's a word uh, that is used three times in this passage, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And each time it is used, it's, it's showing us something. There's a, there's a lesson, or not, I, I, yeah, a lesson, there's something that it's showing us each time, and that's the word behold. Three times the word behold is in this passage. Now, it's a word that maybe we don't use nowadays. I, you know, I don't remember the last time I used the word behold in a normal sentence, and so my challenge for you uh, this next week is to use the word behold in a, in a sentence in with a, you know, maybe even with a non-church person, <laughs> just use the word, just see the kind of reaction that you get. Maybe people are going to look at you really funny, uh, but that's the word we're going to look at this morning. And, and uh, people maybe even don't really know, know what it means, right? Uh, even, even how it's used in the Bible is maybe different from how it's used today. So as we're going to look at this word, uh, the biblical definition, and I'll give you that right away before we we get into this, this biblical def definition that we have, how it's used anyway in, in this gospel is basically this, uh, this phrase, um, don't miss this. Don't miss, like you gotta, you gotta see this. Like look at this, you, you look, don't miss this. You need to see this. It's used to get readers' attention. And so that's why it jumped out at me. So there's three times that it's used. It's like, hey, don't miss this. Catch what's saying here. Look over here, right? It's not just thrown in for dramatic effect, but there's a reason for it. So let's listen to our passage. If you have it, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. And uh, look for the word behold. Uh, and then after we're done reading or going through our passage, then we'll uh, break it down and go through it together. So let's listen to our passage together. Reading from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, 
the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at that saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this must be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I'm going to pray, and then we will dive right in. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, just grateful for this passage. God, would you open up our eyes and our hearts to understand what you have for us? Would you give, yeah, give me wisdom as I continue to work through this and to teach it? Um, God, let us just see you this morning and behold you and just be reminded about how great and how good you are. Amen. Okay, let's start with the first two verses that are, are, list, are we have in our passage. Uh, and these verses kind of set the context of it. So we're going to go into a bit of the, the background and try to set the context. But these verses are, they really help us do that in our first two verses. Verses 26 and 27, they say this. In the, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house, sorry, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So here we have an angel, the angel Gabriel. This is the same Gabriel that we just read about last week. Sam introduced us, talked about uh, the same one last week. Uh, Gabriel that appeared to Zechariah. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 19, and Sam even reminded us of the same Gabriel that was around, that, that spoke, that talked to Daniel. We see this a few times in, in the book of Daniel. This is the same Gabriel, so I love that. So Daniel uh, saw Gabriel, and then Zechariah did. So actually Gabriel just appeared to Zechariah, then I don't know how much longer, like right away. So in the same chapter, Gabriel has shown up. This is the second time that he is showing up. And as we start looking at this passage uh, today, there's something that Luke records that I think it's an important for us to see in here. Uh, it's something that we see in verse 26. In verse 26, we are told that it says that Gabriel was sent from God. It says that right away, that Gabriel was sent from God. And this is very similar to what we saw last week in chapter uh, 1, verse 19. Sam brought this out where Gabriel tells him, he says that he stands in the presence of God, and that Gabriel there was also sent. And the reason I say this is important is because it's a reminder of, of angels and what they are. Angels are, are messengers from God. It's one of their roles is to bring a message. So the message that they bring, and it's a reminder here, isn't their own message, right? They aren't just doing their own thing and bringing their own um, message and, and warnings, but they are sent from God. And that is why they are here. That's why Gabriel here, Gabriel came because God sent him. God sent Gabriel to go to Mary. So that because of that, because they're, they're from God, we can trust them. We can know what they are saying because they're sent from God. So it's, it's, a, it's they're trustworthy in that sense. And so that's a reminder right away. Gabriel was sent from God. And this is the message not just from the angel Gabriel, but this is the message from God. And he comes, it says, to the city of, uh, city of Galilee called Nazareth. 
And in this passage, we're introduced to a character, and that is, that is Mary. Again, you may have heard of her. She's the mother of Jesus. But two times in this passage that we just read, two times it's message or mentioned that Mary was a virgin. And Mary even says that later on in verse 34, that she, that she was a virgin as well. You can see that in the, in the slides right there, those passages that it's mentioned. And it's so important for us to see this and understand this, that Mary was a virgin. And you may think, well, what, what does it matter? Why, why is that important for us to see that? But it does make such a difference, and I don't have time this morning to, to dig into this and to go, go into all of this, but it is important. And one of the main reasons is that is it shows that salvation that, 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 that came from Jesus was not birthed by human effort, right? There's no human effort that could take credit for this, but it was from God. And there's, again, there's so many other reasons I could go into this morning, but I think that's just one of the really important ones. So Mary was, was a virgin. We are told in these first two verses that she was betrothed or uh, engaged to a man, and his name was Joseph. Now, in Jewish practice, girls were usually engaged at the ages of 12 or 13. Uh, that's, they started them early, and that's they were married. Uh, usually by the end, there's like a one-year kind of betrothal period where they were engaged, betrothed. It was arranged by their, their parents, usually. Uh, and it was a, a more of a legal binding agreement than a modern engagement that we have today. It was a, an agreement kind of thing. It was usually only death or divorce that could break this contract, and the couple uh, would be referred to right off the bat as, as husband and wife. If the, if the betrothed husband died, the girl would be considered a widow. That's, that's how it was already made, this agreement. Now, the couple didn't, didn't live together at the beginning or at the, during this engagement period. The girl was to prove her faithfulness and purity during that time. The boy was to prepare a home for his bride-to-be. There would be a seven-day wedding feast, and then the wedding, the marriage would be consummated. Now, this is just kind of background on this period. So this is Mary and Joseph are betrothed. They are not married yet, but they're going through this, this engagement period. So they're preparing themselves. They're getting ready. But they would legally be considered husband and wife. We're reminded as well that Joseph was from the lineage of David. Something else that Again, I don't have a lot of time to go into, but it's important because this is what was prophesied. And there's a lot of prophecy that we, that we see coming out of here. This is one of the prophecies from the, the book of, of Jeremiah. It's mentioned in, in, in Isaiah as well, but Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Right? So there's a, there's a, it was prophesied of this lineage of David, something that was going to come up. Another background thing that I want to point out is where this happened. Something that's important. It was the fact that Jesus was from Nazareth was something that was also prophesied long ago. In Matthew's gospel account, in uh, Matthew 2, verse 23, right, it says he, was, he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. That he would be called a Nazarene. Now, what's interesting about Nazareth is that it was not on any major trade routes, right? It wasn't a, a big, important city. A lot of the roads bypassed it. It was off the beaten path, far from any of the, the centers of the Jewish culture or the Jewish religion. It was, it was out of the way, right? It could be hardly called a city. You know, they estimated from what I read, maybe 400 people, right? It was this obscure village, hardly a place for the king of kings to be born. But even in in Jesus being born in this place, it just reminds us how, of what God can do. How even small things, things that we think are, are insignificant, how they can be used for God's glory and God's purposes. So God chose the city of Nazareth. And salvation is coming. I say all of this for a reason. Because all of this sets the scene for what is going to happen and points us back to prophecy a lot of this is prophecy that was given years ago, and it's a reminder of what's going to happen. And so all of this prophecy, this fulfilled prophecy, we have this incredible reminder of a God who has this rescue plan. And that's one thing that I love about these two verses. Is they bring out this reminder of this prophecy, and it's just a reminder of a God who had a plan 
like so many years ago, to save his people. We're beginning to see, with Jesus' birth, the, beginning to see the, the, this plan unfolding and coming out. Everything's coming into fruition, right? If you read in these first few chapters, salvation is coming. And it's coming in the form of a baby named Jesus. Let's continue with this uh, passage. Let's look at our next two verses, verses 28 to 30. It says, And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Maybe you caught that, but two times in this passage, the angel Gabriel tells Mary that she is favored, that she has found favor with God, that God has seen her, that God has chosen her. And the word here used for favor is this word charis, which means grace or, or unmerited favor. So she has found this grace from God has been giving to her. And the point is that in calling Mary favored, this word tells us that she, there was nothing in Mary that was merited, uh, in Mary that, that, that merited any kind of this acknowledgement, right? She was, God had chosen her, had favored her, was giving her grace. Now she was favored not because of anything that she had done, not because of how good she was, but because God had chosen to favor her. Don't miss that. And then some, you know, there are, are other you know, groups that maybe, maybe teach something different about this, about how they view Mary, but there was nothing in Mary that merited this favor. God, God chose to have favor on her. See, Mary, like all of us, since Adam was a sinner, she wasn't perfect, she wasn't spotless. Again, regardless of what some other beliefs teach us, Mary needed grace just like all of us need God's grace. Favored one, the Lord is with you. She was shown favor because God chose to show her favor, not because she deserved his favor. Mary was a recipient of God's grace. She was a recipient of God's favor. As we continue Gabriel is going to tell Mary that she's going to have a baby. The second, this is the second birth announcement from Gabriel in this chapter. We heard last week that, she had just, that he had just told Zachariah that his wife would conceive in her old age. Right, It was a bit different. In her old age, she would conceive and have a baby. And now he's telling Mary in her young age, as a young virgin, she's going to have a baby. And both of these announcements are these incredible, they're miraculous, maybe even unfathomable with our human understanding. And so when this happened, we can know that it is from God. So he tells Mary that she will have a son, and she is to name him Jesus. Then he's going to tell us, or tell her a few things about who Jesus will be. And in this passage, we're going to get to it right away. We have our first of these behold words where we're reminded about uh, who God is. So let's look at our next few verses, verses 31 to 33. Verse 31 says, And behold, okay, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Gabriel says, behold. Okay. This is what is going to happen. Behold. Don't miss this. Okay. Don't miss this. Make make, make sure you you get this. As he's telling this to to Mary, he's like, don't miss this. Behold, look at this. Check this out. He wants to make sure Mary gets this. And he tells her a few things about Jesus. You're going to have a son and you're going to call him Jesus. 
He will be great. It's the first thing she tells him about Jesus. He will be the, the son of the most high. And his kingdom will not end. His kingdom will reign forever. The focus of this announcement from, from Gabriel, as Gabriel is coming and he's, he's talking to Mary, the focus of this announcement was not on Mary. That's not the focus here. He didn't dwell on her, but how great she was. The focus of this announcement is on Jesus. And, and who he would be. So Gabriel starts off by saying, don't miss this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about your son, but who he's going to be. Don't miss this. You need to see this. This is your son. This is Jesus. And he makes this announcement. And it was, it's so similar to what Isaiah prophesied, Isaiah 7.14. Like, listen to what Isaiah 7.14 says. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look at, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. They're so similar. And Mary likely would have known this prophecy. She would have probably read as a girl this prophecy and known what Isaiah prophesied. And so when, when Gabriel is giving this prophecy to her, she would have known right away. She would have made this connection right away. Gabriel says his, his name is going to be Jesus. You are to call him Jesus, which in this word means savior. He was coming to save. That, that was the reason why he was coming. That's why he, he came. And we're going to see this. This is not on the screen, but in, later on in chapter 19 of, of Luke, Luke 19, 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came, and his name means Savior. So look at some of the things that, that the angel tells Mary about. Her son Mary is told that he will be great. He will be great. And maybe there is, in my mind, something lost in that translation. You know, when I hear the word great, it doesn't seem to do justice for how incredible and awesome and amazing that Jesus is and would be, right? Maybe it's just me, but when someone says something is, ah, it's great. I think of, man, it's like, it's okay. Like it's maybe not the best, but like, again, maybe there's something lost in translation here. You know, piece of advice for you married men, and maybe you know this already. If, you're, if your wife ever asks you to, about something and says, you know, what, what do you think? Maybe she made something or maybe she bought something and you say, oh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's great. Like it's maybe not the best answer, right? Like, but that's what we're told about Jesus, that he would be great. Again, maybe in English it loses that translation, but what it's saying here is that it doesn't just mean great, but in fact, he's going to be greater than anything, than anything that has ever lived or will live. This may only be a, like a four-word description that starts off about Jesus, but it's such a deep and a profound description about Jesus. He will be great. So much so that even eternity, all of eternity, will not exa ex exhaust the depth of the greatness of Jesus. John the Baptist was prophesied Sam brought this up last week in a similar way. It said, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now it's different. But clearly the greatness that John would have would just pale in comparison to the infinite greatness of Jesus. Mary is told that Jesus will be great. Another thing. He will be the son of the most high. This means he will be the son of God. That's what it means. He will be the son of God. Can you imagine Mary hearing this? This 12 or 13 year old girl is being told you are going to give birth to the son of God. In Jewish thought and how they did their wording, a son was thought to be a carbon copy of his father, Right? You are so much like your father. You are your father's son. Whatever that's kind of maybe, our, maybe the loosely translation in English that we have. 
right? But calling someone else's son was a way of signifying equality, that they were equal. So here, the angel was telling her that her son would be equal to, because he would be the, the son of the Most High, he would be equal to the Most High God. Imagine hearing that, the angel coming and telling you that he will be great, but he's also going to be the son of God. He's going to be God himself. That's what Gabriel was telling her. And that's why the angel says, behold, right? That's why he says, don't miss this. You need to catch this, Mary. You need to understand this. Behold, the one you carry will be God. As well, he tells her that God would give him David's throne and he will reign for. Ever. And I love this because there's hope in this. There's so much hope in this passage. Your son's going to reign forever. His kingdom will not end. It'll be forever. And as we, we read this, you know, a couple thousand years later, we, we need to behold this. We, we can't miss this either. Jesus Greater than anything. Do you, do you believe that? You know that this is still true today? Do you know that? That he's still greater than anything? It wasn't just for the set time period. What in your life do you think is, is great? Your job? Maybe you got a great job. Great family. Jesus greater than those things in your, in your heart? Do you elevate Jesus above those things? He's still greater. We, we're told that. He's, he's the greatest. So he will be great. And it still applies today. There are so many things that we call great. But nothing and no one is greater than Jesus. Don't, don't miss this. You need to catch this. It's not just the, the son of God. He, he is God. Make sure you see this. He's still God. And he still reigns. And don't miss this. He will reign forever. He still reigns today. Do you know the hope of that statement? In a world that's filled with pain and, and sickness and sin and, and death. And in all of these things, we may think that what reigns is sin and sickness. We, we can begin to think that, that man, it's, we live in a world where just sickness reigns or sin reigns. Yeah, we live in a world where there is sickness and sin and death. But Jesus still reigns. He still reigns. We know that's not, that, it, that, that is still true. And he will reign forever. His kingdom will not end. Don't, you guys, don't miss this. Right? You need to see this. His kingdom will not end. Do you know the hope of that? Like there's so much hope in knowing that. It's forever. Keep going. In our passage, verse 34 to 37. This is Mary now is going to respond. So Gabriel has told her what, you know, a bit about Jesus. And then Mary responds in verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a, a virgin? And he answered here, her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her. With her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. So after Gabriel tells Mary about who Jesus is, who he will be, Mary asks just a very logical question like how and it's and it's a it's a it's a good question it's an appropriate question like how 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 will this happen like i'm i'm a virgin 
How is this possible? I'm not, I'm not even married yet. Now Mary does, you know, maybe it sounds similar to what, how Zechariah replied, right? And in his response that we looked at last week. But I, I don't think that there's, the difference is though, in Mary's response, I don't think there's unbelief in it. She's not asking, man, can you do it? She's asking how you will do it. See, her question builds, builds on faith, not unbelief. And maybe this is, I think this is the reason why Gabriel doesn't rebuke her. Like we saw what happened to Zechariah where he was made mute, right? This is not what's happening here. There's, it's just a question. And in the answer, we are reminded of what God can do. So this is the how of what can do. So Mary says, how? How, do you, how can this happen? And so Gabriel answers, this is the how. The first thing we see in verse 35 is that Mary is told that the, that the Holy Spirit will come upon her. This is similar to what was said about Zechariah in, in John 1, uh, 1 15. But however, this, this birth announcement is so different than the one for Zechariah. See, both of these are miraculous. Both are done with the power of the Holy Spirit. But this announcement to Mary was done without an earthly father. This is the power of the Most High. So she says, how? How will this happen? How, how can he do it? And he just says, the power of God, essentially. The power of the Most High. You wonder how it's going to happen. You wonder how anything can happen. It's the power of God is going to do this. That's how. This unlimited, unfathomable power, that's how this is going to happen. He also has that the power of the Most High will overshadow you. They use that word over. Shadow you. This word overshadow here is we see this elsewhere in, in scripture. I wish I had time to go into all this, this description of what it means to overshadow, but it's the same word that is used for the cloud that, that overshadowed the tabernacle. We saw this, you can see this in Exodus. Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. God overshadows his people with his wings. A uh, cloud overshadows the disciples during the, the transfiguration. But the Lord overshadows his people during, during battle. All these, these words for overshadows, it means the same thing. The words means to surround or, or to encompass. Or in a, in a metaphorical sense, to, to influence, right? So this word overshadow is encompassing, it's surrounding. So it's this word that the Spirit of God will surround Mary to produce a child in her womb. This is the act of the Holy Spirit. This is what it's doing. It's overshadowing. It's surrounding. It's encompassing. Mary, how will this happen? That's how. The power of God is just going to encompass. It's gonna, the power of God is going to surround you. That's how it's going to happen. Reminder in this passage as well that this is not a, a, some sort of divine and human, um, you know, collaboration that we see, right? Sometimes in pagan mythology, if you've ever read any kind of pagan mythology, you see these, in the ancient writings, there are legends of, of gods that come down and, and procreate with women on earth, right? And they have babies, so they're these half God, half human babies, that it is not what is happening here. That's not a, a half God, half man kind of thing. Jesus would be born as fully God and also fully man. But it was God who did all the work in this. It is the power of God at work in here. And so Gabriel's telling her that. This is how God will do it. Through his power. And it points to what he can do what is impossible for human beings. And so it says, she says, how? And he says, well, because of the power of God. And then Gabriel says, therefore, so because of that, because of all of this, he will be called holy. This word holy, we've talked about this before. This means, this means set apart. Jesus would be born holy. He will be called holy. Not just born holy, but he will be called holy. 
But if we look at these next verse, the next two verses, this really explains the how. And this is what I love. This is, this is the how of it. And here's our behold word that we have again. Look at verses 36 and 37 again. I want to read them for you again. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. So how? How does he do this? The answer to Mary's question is that nothing is impossible with God. That's how. Anything is possible. The, Mary, or the angel tells Mary of her relative Elizabeth and how even in her old age she is pregnant. That's the answer to how a virgin can be pregnant. How can it happen? Well, your, your relative, your barren old relative is also pregnant. That's how. And Gabriel, I love how he emphasizes the miraculous aspect of the pregnancy with two descriptions of her. He describes uh, Elizabeth this way, that she was old and that she was barren. So that it, would just, it brings out the miraculous and what is happening. Old women who were barren remained barren unless there was some kind of miraculous intervention. It also was a reminder that she endured this, these nasty comments regarding her infertility. We saw that in verse 25, right? So it's a reminder of what God can do. And it starts off with, behold, it's like, don't miss this. Mary, be, look at this, pay attention to this. You need to see this. All of our questions of how can be answered with this statement that nothing is impossible with God. Don't miss this. I read this quote this past week in a, in a commentary I was using. It said this, this is, the moment you admit the existence of God... You must deny the impossible. With God, it's nothing that a barren woman and a virgin woman would both conceive. In fact, it's just like God. Love that. When you admit the existence of God, you must deny the impossible. Because anything is possible with God. Nothing is impossible. And we see so many examples of this throughout Scripture. Miraculous things happen all the time. Things that we can't explain with human wisdom. There's a close parallel of this passage that we see in Genesis. Genesis chapter 18 verse 14. It says, it says this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah will have a son. This is the assurance that Gabriel gives to Mary. But it's also our assurance as well. Guys, nothing is impossible with God. The thing you're praying for, the thing that maybe seems impossible with human wisdom, it doesn't make sense, but you're praying for it anyway. Nothing's impossible with God. Keep praying for that. God can do it. You know what it is. We all have things maybe we're praying for. We may even ask the question, how can this happen? I don't know how. But I'm going I'm I'm to pray for it. It doesn't make sense in, in human wisdom, but I'm going to keep praying for it. Keep praying for that, guys, because nothing is impossible with God. Behold, don't miss this. You guys need to see this. This is what God can do. At the beginning, we were reminded this behold word of, of who God would be. He would be great. He would be reigned forever, the son of God. And now we're seeing of who, of what Jesus can do. That nothing would be impossible with him. So twice already we're reminded, behold, look at this. Don't miss this. Let's look at our last behold statement. The last verse in this passage, verse 38. It says, and Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. See, this is Mary's response. Let it be to me according to your word. We already know 
that Gabriel was sent to her from God so we can know that what she is hearing is from God so she can trust that. So Mary responds, which may it happen. May it happen just as you say. This is not according to human wisdom, but according to what God will do. Behold. Don't miss this. This is how she responds, and her response is one of total faith. Mary was, just think about her situation that she was in. This extremely like embarrassing, this difficult position. Man, she's betrothed to Joseph. They were engaged to be married. Now she's being told she's going to have a baby. Joseph's going to know that it's not his. He would know that. She wouldn't know, you know how he would respond when, when he found out. She knew that she would likely be accused of adultery, an offense punishable by, by death, by, by stoning. Yet she willingly and graciously submitted to the will of God. Saying, so, yeah, okay. Let it be to me. If, if you're telling me this, I know you're sent from God. Let it, let it be to me what you say. Her words and her response are, are, are similar, so similar to what, what Esther said in chapter 4, verse 16. Right, when she is, is preparing, going, going to the king, she's going to plead for her people and just says, like, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to do it. See, this is the response of people of faith. Even when it goes against human wisdom, even when it doesn't make sense, or human understanding of it, we, we do it. This is a, there's submission to God here. I think that's why we have this word, behold, again, don't miss how she responds. You need to see her answer here. In our passage this morning, we see the angel Gabriel telling Mary that God was planning to do something just humanly impossible. Human logic would, would agree that, that a virgin could not give birth to a child. That was impossible, yet that is exactly what would happen. See, when God speaks of doing the impossible, it, it's no longer absurd. It's, it's just God. See, we have a God who does the seemingly impossible. The Bible is filled with stories of this. This book, scriptures are filled with stories of things that are impossible. There are reminders in here that anything is possible. Just read through it. It's not hard to find them. Miracle after miracle in here, but the greatest miracle that we have, guys, it's salvation. It's how the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ made us right with a righteous God. So we were so dead in our sin that we deserved the wrath of this righteous God. Yet God in his grace and his mercy provided a way for us to be saved, provided salvation for us. We see it through the birth that was just announced, through Jesus' birth. That's how we're gonna, we would find our salvation Three times we saw this word behold in our passage. First time we were told to behold who Jesus is. The second we behold what Jesus can do. And the third was to behold uh, a, a response to God, a, a response of faith to God. So let's behold our God. Don't miss this. You need to see this. Look, be reminded of who God is. Let's not forget who he is. Let's not forget what he has done. You guys, let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep our eyes focused on him, remembering who he is and what he has done, so then we can know how to respond to him. But let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep beholding Jesus. Let's keep remembering what he did. I think if we keep all those things in our minds of what he has done, it helps us just to behold him. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget who he is and what he has done. I, I just I want to 
give you one last passage before I close. Hebrews 12, verse 2. One and two, I'll, I'll read one as well. Therefore, since we are surrounded by, by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look at this. Looking to Jesus. Just beholding Jesus. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated the right hand of the throne of God. He is still reigning, still there today. Church, let's behold Jesus. We pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. For the reminders that we have in this passage of, of who he is. Of, of what he can do, God. And for us, as we, as we are here a couple thousand years later, we know that this is still for us today. We know that these reminders are still for us of, of who Jesus is, that he is great. And this reminder of that nothing is impossible, God, for the thing that we're praying for. God, give us the strength to keep praying for that, to keep asking for that, knowing that, with all, that you are, uh, can make all things possible. Help us to continue to respond in faith, like we see here. Help us just to behold here, to leave here, rejoicing and magnifying what you have done as we behold you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.